Chapter 15 of Humorous Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Humorous Ghost Stories, selected by Dorothy Scarborough. Chapter 15 The Ghost of Miser Brimson by Eden Philpotts. From Tales of the Tenements by Eden Philpotts, published in America by John Lane Company, and in England by John Murray, by permission of the publishers and Eden Philpotts. The Ghost of Miser Brimson by Eden Philpotts, Part 1. Penniless and proud he was, and that pair don't draw a man to pleasant places when they be in double harness. There's only one thing can stop em if they take the bit between their teeth, and that's a woman. So there, you might say, lies the text of the tale of Jonathan Drake, of Dunnerbridge Farm, a tenement in the forest of Dartymoor. Twas Naboth's vineyard to Duchy, and the greedy thing would have given a very fair price for it, without a doubt, but the Drake folk held their land and wouldn't part with it, and boasted a freehold of fifty acres in the very midst of the forest. They did well, too, and moved with the times, and kept their heads high for more generations than I can call home. And then they come to what all families, whether gentle or simple, always come to soon or late, and that's a black sheep or bellwether. Bad uns they'll be in every generation of a race, but the trouble begins when a bad un chances to be up top, and if the head of the family is a drunkard or a spendthrift, or built on too free and flowing a pattern for this workaday shop, then the next generation may look out for squalls, as the sailor men say. "'Twas Jonathan's grandfather that did the harm at Dunnerbridge. He had sport in his blood on his mother's side, and twas horses ran him into trouble. He backed him and was ruined, and then his son bred him and didn't do very much better. So when the pair of em dropped out of the hunt and died with their backs to the wall, one after t'other, it looked as if the game was up for them to follow. By good chance, however, Tom Drake had but one child, a boy, the Jonathan I be telling about, and when his father and grandfather passed away within a year of each other, Dunnerbridge was left to Tom's widow and her son, him then being twenty-two. She was for selling Dunnerbridge, and getting away from Dartymoor, because the place had used her bad, and she hated the sight of it. But Jonathan, a proud chap even then, got the lawyers to look into the matter, and they told him twasn't vital for Dunnerbridge to be sold, though it might ease his pocket and smooth his future to do so, especially as Dutchy wanted the place rather bad and had offered the value of it. And Jonathan's mother was on the side of Dutchy too, and went on her knees to the man to sell, but he wouldn't. He had a bee in his bonnet sometimes, and he said that all the drakes would rise out of their graves to Widecomb Churchyard, and haunt his rising up and going down if he were to do such a thing, just to suit his own convenience, and be rid of the place. So he made a plan with the creditors. It figured out that his father and grandfather had owed near a thousand pounds between them, and Jonathan actually set himself to pay it off to the last penny. "'Twas the labor of years— but by the time he was thirty-three he done it, at what cost of scrimpin' and screwin' only his mother might have told. She never did tell, however, for she died two year before the last item was paid. Some went as far as to declare that twas her son's miserly ways hurried her into her grave, and for all I know that may have done so, for tis certain in her husband's life she had a better time. Tom was the large-hearted, juicy, easy sort, as like meat on the table and plenty to wash it down, and he loved Mercy Jane Drake very well, and when he died the only thought that troubled him was leaving her, and the last thing he advised his son was to sell Dunnerbridge and take his mother off the moor down to in-country where she'd come from. But Jonathan was made of different stuff, and was rumored by old people that had known the family for several generations that he favored an ancient forefather by name of Brimson Drake. This bygone man was a miser, and the richest of the race. He lived in the days when we were at war with France and America, and when Princeton sprang up, and a girt war prison was built there, to cage all the chaps we got on our hands through winning such a lot of sea battles. 
and Miser Brimson was said to have made thousands by helping rich fellows to escape from the prison. Truth and falsehood mixed made up his story as twas handed down, but one thing appeared to be fairly true about it, which was that when the miser died, and Dunnabridge went to his cousin, the horse racer, not a penny of his fortune ever came into the sight of living men. So some said twas all nonsense, and he never had no money at all, but only pretended to it, and others again declared that he knew too well who'd follow in his shoes at Dunnabridge and hid his money accordingly, so that no drake should have it, for he hated his heirs as only a miser can hate him. So things stood when Mercy Jane died and Jonathan was left alone. He paid all his relations' debts, and he had his trouble and the honor of being honorable for his pains. Everybody respected him something wonderful. But all the same, a few of his mother's friends always did say, "'Twas a pity he put his dead father's good name afore his living mother's life. However, we am not built in the pattern of our fellow creatures, and tis only fools that waste time blaming a man for being himself. Jonathan went his stern way, and then, in the lonely days after his parent was taken, when he lived at Dunnabridge with naught but two hinds and a brace of sheep-dogs, twas suddenly borne in upon his narrow sight, that there might be other women still in the world, though his mother had gone out of it. And he also discovered, doubtless, that a home without a woman therein be merely the cruel mockery of what a home should be. A few good folk watched Jonathan to see what he'd do about it, and no doubt a maiden here and there was interested too, because, though a terrible poor man, he wasn't bad to look at, though rather hard about the edge of the jaw, and rather short and stern in his manners to human creatures and beasts alike. And then begin his funny courtin, if you could call it courtin, where a poor man allows himself the luxury of pride at the wrong time, and makes a show of himself in consequence. At least that's my view. But you must know that a good few, quite as wise as me, took the other side and held that Donathan covered his name with glory when he changed his mind about Hyssop Burges. That was her bitter name. But a pleasanter girl never walked on shoe leather. She was Farmer Stonewer's niece to White Works, and he took her in for charity, and always said twas the best day's work as ever he had done, a straight, hard-working, cheerful sort of a girl, with nothing to name about her very special, save a fine shape, and a proud way of holding her head in the air, and looking her fellow creatures in the eyes. Proud she was for certain, and terrible particular as to her friends, but there happened to be that about Jonathan that made flint to her steel. He knowed she was penniless, or he'd not have looked at her twice, and when after a short, fierce sort of courting she took him, everybody felt pleased about it but Farmer Stoneware, were, who couldn't abide the thought of losing Hyssop, though his wife had warned him any time this four year that twas bound to happen. Farmer and the girl were sitting waiting for Jonathan one night, and she was a bit nervous, and he was trying for to calm her. Jonathan must be told, she says. It can't go on no longer. Then tell him, says her uncle, good powers, he says, to see you one would think the news was the worst as could ever fall between a pair of poor lovers instead of the best. I know him a lot better than you, she tells Farmer, and I know how plaguy difficult he can be where money's the matter. He very near throwed me over when in a weak moment I axed him to let me buy my own tokening ring. Red as a turkey's wattles did he flame, and said I'd insulted him, and now when he hears the secret, I can't for the life of me guess how he'll take it. "'Twas a pity you didn't tell him when he offered for you,' declared Hyssop's aunt. Proud he is as a silly peacock, and terrible frightened of seeming to look after money, or even casting his eye where it bides. But he came to you without any notion of the windfall, and he loved you for yourself like an honest man." and you loved him the same way, and right well you know that if your old cousin had left you five thousand pounds instead of five hundred, Jonathan Drake was the right chap for you. He can't blame himself, for not a soul on Dottymore but us three has ever heard tell about the money. But he'll blame me for having money at all, answered the girl. He said a dozen times afore he offered for me that he'd never look at a woman if she'd got more cash than what he had himself. That's why I couldn't bring myself to confess to it and lose him. And after we was tokened, it got to be harder still. Why not bide till you married, then? asked Mrs. Stoneware. Since it has gone so long, let it go longer. 
and surprise him with the news on the wedding night, eh, James? No, answered the farmer. Enough is as good as a feast. Tis squandering blessings to do that at such a time. Keep the news till some rainy day when he's wondering how to get round a tight corner. That's the moment to tell him, and that's the moment he's least likely to make a face at the news. But Hyssop wouldn't put it off no more. She said as she'd not have any further peace till the murder was out. And that very night, sure enough, when Jonathan come over from Dunnerbridge for his bit of love-making, and the young couple had got the farm parlor to themselves, she plumped it out, finding him in a very kindly mood. They never cuddled much, for he wasn't built that way, but he'd not disdain to sit beside her, and put his arm around her now and again, when she picked up his hand and drew it round. Then off and on she'd rub her cheek against his mutton-chop whiskers, till he had to kiss her in common politeness. Well, Hyssop got it out, Lord alone knows how. As she said afterwards, she got it out and told him that an old-aged cousin had died, and left her a nice little windfall of money, and how she'd never touched a penny, but let it goody in the bank, and how she prayed and hoped would help him to Dunnerbridge, and how, of course, he must have the handling of it, being a man, and so cruel clever in such things. She went on and on, pretty well frightened to stop and hear him, but after she said it over about a dozen times, her breath failed her, and she shut her mouth and tried to smile, and looked up terrible anxious and pleading at Jonathan. His hard gray eyes bored into her like a brace of gimlets, and in return for all her talk he asked but one question. "'How long have you had this here money?' he said. She told the truth, faltering and shaking under his glare. Four years and upwards, Jonathan.' "'That's years and years afore I asked you to marry me.' "'Yes, Jonathan.' "'And you remember what I said about never marrying anybody as had more than what I have?' "'Yes, Jonathan.' And you know full well how many a time I told you that after I paid off all my father's debts I had not left, and would be years afore I could build up anything to call money? Yes, Jonathan. Very well, then, he cried out, and his brow crooked down and his fist clenched. Very well, you've deceived me deliberate, and if you do that in one thing you would in another. I'm going out of this house this instant moment, and you can tell your relations why tis. I'm terrible sorry, Hyssop Burgess, for no man will ever love you better than what I did, and so you'd have lived to find out when all this here court and tomfoolery was over, and you'd come to be my wife. But now I'll have none of you, for you've played with me, and so, so I'll bid you good-bye. He went straight out without more speech, and she tottered, weeping to her uncle and aunt. They couldn't believe their senses, and Jimmy Stoneward declared thereon that any man who could make himself such a masterpiece of a fool as Jonathan had done that night was better out of the marriage state than in it. He told Hyssop as she'd had a marvellous escape from a prize zany, and his wife said the same. But the girl couldn't see it like that. She knowed Jonathan weren't a prize zany, and his raging pride didn't anger her, for she admired it something wonderful and it only made her feel her loss all the crueler to see what a terrible, rare, haughty sort of a chap he was. There were a lot of other men who would have had her, and twice as many again if they'd known about the money, but they all seemed as tame as robins beside her hawk of a Jonathan. She had plenty of devil in her, too, when it come to the fighting pitch, and now, while he merely said that the match was broken off through a difference of opinion and gave no reason for it, she set to work with all her might to get him back again, and used her love-sharpened wit so well as she knew how to best him into matrimony. End of chapter 15